have to have alternating current is because alternating current sets up a changing magnetic field. Since the current's going in and coming out and going in and coming out, what that's doing is it's, it's creating a magnetic field in, in one coil of wire, but in making it come in and out and in and out, that magnetic field shifts from North Pole here, South Pole here, to North, North Pole here, South Pole here here so it's almost as if you're taking a magnet and you're spinning it around and around and around so that whenever we take a secondary coil and put it up next to it the requirement for creating electricity with magnet is to have a changing magnetic field right so by using the alternating current we create that changing magnetic field and then if we put a secondary coil next to it then we create current in that secondary coil Whereas if it didn't change, the magnetic field wouldn't change. And since the magnetic field doesn't change, we couldn't create current in the second pole. So which way it goes doesn't really matter. It's, it's just a, a, for that purpose, it, you know, we're, I'm not gonna ask you which, which end the magnetic field comes out of, or which end it goes into. The, the point of reference is just so that you understand that it changes, right? Because it, you know, Theoretically, how do we know the north end of the magnet is not the south end of the magnet and, the, and vice versa? You know, how do we know the north is truly north and not south? Yeah. Yeah, it's just a label we put on it. So, all right, so anatomy of the pelvis. You're going to run into some questions sooner or later that talk about the innominate bones. And the innominate bones are just your iliac bones. It's the same, they're just a different word for the same bones. And sometimes you'll hear it referred to the just the the not really the pelvic girdle, but the, the sacrum attached to the hip bones as being the the innominate bone, the, the entire thing just being one single bone. So it really consists of four bones. The innominate bones, the left and right innominate bones are are all of the, the bones of the pelvis proper attached to the sacrum and the coccyx. So we're going to talk about the innominate bones. The, the individual pieces of them, because there's three bones to make those up too, and the sacrum and the coccyx, coccyx itself. So it's the base of the uh, trunk and a girdle for the attachment of the, the lower limbs and a, uh, a protection for those organ systems in the, in the lower pelvic cavity. So pelvic girdle proper, what we've got are two hip bones or referred to as the os coccyx or the innominate bones, but there are three bones that make those up. So the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. So the, the ischium and the pubis form what we call the anterior pelvic bones, and it's the lower portion down here, right? So we call this thing right here where these two come together the symphysis pubis. The ischium and the ischial tuberosities are what you actually sit on. And we hear a tailbone, uh, you sit on your tailbone, we really tailbone is kind of this thing back here, which is the coccyx. Whereas your ischial tuberosities are, are what you actually sit on. Those are your butt bones right there. Okay. So the hip bones, ilium, uh, ischium, and the pubic bones. And they all join together 
you probably can't see it, but they all join together in the acetabulum. All three of them form a portion of the, the socket portion of the ball and socket joint. Okay? <clears throat> So the ilium is the biggest of the three, and it consists of body and broad curl, uh, curved portion that's sometimes refer, referred to as the ala. And it forms a superior two fifths, so the bulk of it, um, the acetabulum is formed by the ilium. So it's got four prominent processes, and you kind of work your way through these. You got anterior, superior, iliac spine. So you got two differentiating uh, terms there. Anterior, so it sticks out of the front. Superior, above something else, right? So if you've got that, then naturally what you're going to have is an anterior. That one's superior, so you've got a inferior iliac spine. I don't really have an acronym for that, and we don't really talk about it a whole lot. But you've also got a posterior superior iliac spine, and therefore you're going to have a posterior inferior iliac spine. So the, the top uppermost portion is what you're most familiar with, and that will be your iliac crest. So you've got superior, inferior, superior, inferior. The sciatic notch is what we refer to that big hunk of bone that's missing in the posterior portion. So the ischium consists of body and the ischial ramus. The body forms posterior two fifths of the acetabulum, and the ischium, uh, ischial ramus joins together with the inferior uh, ramus of the pubic bone. So again, the ischial tuberosity is where you sit. Ischial spine is located on the upper posterior portion of the body. And a lesser uh, sciatic notch is the indentation just below the ischial spine. Pubic bone consists of a body, a superior ramus, inferior ramus. You're not going to have to label all this stuff. Um, but the uh, pubic bones and the ischium bones form what we call the obturator foramen. And the obturator foramen for these two holes right here in the anterior pelvic bones. These are going to be good indicators of whether or not we've got fracture. You're going to look at the anterior pelvic bones. Anytime we've got a bone that's got a great curvature in it, like these bones, or the uh, mandible, any, any kind of bone that's got a, a really steep curvature to it, it isn't going to break in just one place. It's going to break in multiple places. So it's kind of like uh, taking a pretzel, you know, if, if you were to try to break a portion off of a pretzel, where is it going to break? It's going to break in two different places. You can't, you can't just snap it in one place. You've got to snap it in two separate places. So pelvic bones, that's what's going to happen. So this structure here, if it's going to break, it's going to break in two different places. If we break the, the ilium, theoretically we could have a fracture here and then a separation of the, the anterior pelvic bones at the symphysis pubis. But in a lot of cases, even um, ileal fractures are going to be associated with that anterior pelvic bone fractures. So imaging these anterior pelvic bones is going to be kind of difficult because they're at an angle. They're really at two angles to the image receptor in central right. So we'll get there here in a bit. Off the right frame. So that's what it all looks like from the anterior aspect. And from the lateral aspect is acetabulum. So the femur we already talked about, we're not going to run back through all that. You know the greater trochanter, the lesser trochanter, you know where the head is and the neck is. Uh, you know the intertrochanteric line, all the applicable parts to it. So <clears throat> the joints in the pelvis, we've got the, the hip joint, you know we have a tendency to think of the the uh, iliac crest as being our hip, and really our hip is a joint. The hip joint is the ball and socket joint, the head of the femur and the acetabulum. So that's our major articulation, but you've also got articulations at the spine 
at what we call the sacroiliac joints. So this is a, the iliac bone, and that's the sacrum, so the joint in between them. It's a fibrous joint. It doesn't move a whole lot, but it is the sacroiliac joint, the SI joint. Then the symphysis pubis, where we talked about those were the two uh, anterior sets of anterior pelvic bones come together. And it's slightly movable, and I think we talked about this uh, when we we're talking about the anatomy. It does separate slightly during childbirth to open up the birth canal a little bit and, and uh, give a little bit of room there. Sometimes, though, <clears throat> we'll have fractures in the pelvic bones. Of, mentioned that a minute ago that will open that up significantly so you may have a huge gap in between your anterior pelvic bones. So there's differences in the anatomy, the appearance of the anatomy, and uh, this is really you know one of the foundations for forensic medicine. If they find a skeleton somewhere they can differentiate between whether it's male or female by looking in part at the pelvis. So in males the pelvis is heavier, and it's more narrow, the hips are more narrow, and you know, you, you look at athletic people uh, who don't have, you know, they're not carrying around a few extra pounds, and you can kind of see this. Uh, male hips tend to be much more narrow, and the angle of the simplest pubis you can't see, but it's more acute. More acute meaning it's more, it's more like at a 45 degree angle, it's like that. Female pelvis, the anterior pelvic bones where they come together is more broad, okay? So what I'm talking about is this angulation right here indicates to me that's a male. Kind of <clears throat> pretty steep angulation. If it was female, it'd be coming off at an angle more like that, okay? So we talked about all those, or some of those anyway. You know what the iliac crest is, you know what the ASIS is, you know where the symphysis pubis is, greater trochanter, uh, ischial tuberosity, tip of the coccyx is at the very apex of that bottom bone, uh, what, what I pointed out before was what some people refer to as tailbone. All right, so in hip localization, this is where it starts. I said they, they kind of get complicated in the textbook, uh, and, and they do. Uh, really all you gotta do to find a hip is, is go just below the ASIS and you're gonna find it. But they've got a, a number of steps you need to, to memorize or at least be able to, uh, to uh, recognize on, on a test all the way through the registry. So highest point of the gro greater trochanter lies in the same plane as the hip joint and the coccyx. So you can find the hip joint and the coccyx just by finding the greater trochanter. It's on the same horizontal lateral plane. <laughs> so the most prominent point in the greater trochanter is the same plane as the symphysis pubis. So if you can get the patient to internally and externally rotate their foot so that you can find the greater trochanter, the very top of the greater trochanter is gonna be the same plane at the same level as, as the symphysis pubis. So, uh, you know, if, if you need to localize the, the uh, greater trochanter, you couldn't feel the greater trochanter because the patient was hypersthenic and they've got a lot of hip, right? They got a lot of soft tissue there. Then you could theoretically palpate the symphysis pubis or really, really, really don't recommend that you do that. So you can palpate the ASIS and the superior margin of the symphysis pubis and you could find the greater trochanter if you uh, were so inclined to do so. I've had, I don't know if I've told you all this or not, but I've, I've had uh, female techs that, that were they routinely palpated the symphysis pubis for KUB and I've, I've had them on uh, some male patients, you know, they, the patient didn't know what they were, were gonna be doing and you know, they palpated the symphysis pubis for the, their scalp view, and, and then uh, let's say we're, they were doing an IVP, which y'all probably haven't seen. Might not have seen anybody seen an IVP. No. It's a study of the kidneys where we put contrast in the patient, so we, we shoot multiple views over and over again. So for whatever reason, you know, this, this one stands out, but for whatever reason we were doing an IVP on a, on a probably a 14-year-old boy, 
right? And she shot the the uh, KUB scout, and she came back in to readjust, and he had readjusted himself so he would get felt, you know. So I, I really just don't recommend that you get in the habit of palpating the the uh, ASI or the the symphysis because something like that could happen, and nobody wants that. Uh, aside possibly from a 14 year old boy, apparently. So I don't recommend that. I don't recommend you palpate anybody's symphysis pubis. Uh, you'll see some people do it, but that's my official position on it is there are other ways to get around it. So what they're saying is that you palpate the ASIS and the symphysis pubis, then you draw visually uh, an imaginary line that connects the two. And then you can find the anatomy that you want by drawing another line perpendicular to that line and what you're going to find is that one and a half inches down that line, you're going to find the femoral head. Two and a half inches down that line, you'll find the uh, femoral neck. That's a lot of steps, right? That's a lot of steps to go to just to find where the anatomy is going to be, when the anatomy is going to be directly below the ASIS. Top of the film at the ASIS, longitudinal line running straight down from the the ASIS, you should be able to find the, the uh, femur. Or top of the collimated fields, let's say. Since y'all are only using the same size image receptor, top of the collimated, <coughs> collimated field, adjust your collimated field to 10 by 12, put the top of that collimated field at the <coughs> ASIS and run that line of collimation straight down the femur. You, you should find it. Top of the collimated field here, and then that line going straight up and down and you're going to hit it every time. And you don't have to go poking around on, you know, symphysis pubis and doing any kind of mental calculations, anything like that, okay? Also, you know, if you do that, you put that line right there, then you don't even have to use 10 by 12. You can use more like, you know, 8 by 12. Probably make him a little bit more. And that's what that says. All right, so whenever we're taking images, we want to remove uh, any uh, heavy elastic. You want to get it off the patient if at all possible. Obviously, if they've got a broken hip, you're not going to really undress the patient, and it really kind of becomes moot. But if you've got a walkie-talkie type patient, just go ahead and tell them to take everything off and put a gown on. Uh, put a gown on, then make sure that you cover the patient up too as well. So if you've got an ambul ambulatory patient, it's just going to be supine on the table. If they're uh, non-ambulatory, you may have to leave them on the backboard. You may have to shoot them on the, the stretcher, which becomes a problem because if you're shooting a hip on a full-grown person, you're going to need a, not only the image receptor, but you're going to need a grid as well. And the problem becomes if, uh, if you're taking a, a hip on a, a bed, then what you may have is once you get the, the image receptor under the patient, it may tilt a little bit. Has, have y'all been through grids at all, really? And construction of grid and how it works? Anybody? No? Okay. A grid, what a grid is, is it looks like a thin little box, and what you've got in it are uh, pieces of lead that are standing on end. So they're little bitty strips of lead that are standing upright like that. And the purpose for a grid is that whenever you create scattered radiation inside of the patient, the scatter goes off at funny angles, right? So if you've got lead and the, the x-ray beam is, is perpendicular, it'd be perpendicular to the image receptor, but parallel to those grid strips, it'll go through and everything's good, right? So can you see the light through there? Yeah, but if I, uh, if my scatter radiation is going at an angle to those, then what that's equivalent to is it trying to go through there. Can you see the light through that? No. So it absorbs the scatter radiation. The problem with the grid is that if you've got any kind of an angulation on a grid, um, and it's not an angulation that goes this way in, in relationship to the grid strips, but it's going at an angle this way, then even your good x-rays are going to be absorbed. 
That's what we call a grid cutoff. Okay? So you got all these things standing up like that, and if your grid's tilted because you're in a soft bed, then you're gonna have a grid cutoff and you're not gonna get damaged. Okay? So that's a problem with grid use, is that you gotta be careful of that if, if you happen to be on tabletop. Or not on tabletop, but in patient's bed. So radiation protection is going to be really kind of tough to provide radiation protection. Um, you know, you can provide it for areas of the anatomy that, that aren't going to be represented on the image receptor. It's just going to be very difficult to, to shield the gonads on, on a patient for a hip or a pelvis. Uh, you, you don't want to include shielding that, that would obstruct diagnosis. Does that the patient hold her breath? It doesn't have to be deep breath in and blow it out, just tell them to stop breathing and all that. So pelvis, AP of the pelvis, all we're gonna do for AP of the pelvis is basically a, uh, a low KUB. So I have a patient lay flat on their back, they can elevate their, their knees if they want to, but don't elevate them much because we're also gonna be looking at the, the, uh, the hips as well. So really better to extend the knees, uh, but if a patient can't, you know, totally extend the knees, you might put a little, little roll under their knees just to, to relieve that back strain a little bit. So we want unrotated, which means that our ASIS to the, uh, are gonna be equidistant. They're gonna be the same distance from the image receptor. You're gonna medially rotate both feet 15, 20 degrees so that we uh, don't have that foreshortening of the femoral neck. Again, as providing the patient doesn't have a fracture, we'll want to internally rotate the toes 15, 20 degrees. That, that places the femoral neck parallel to the image receptor so they don't have to Top of the image receptor should be one, one to one and a half inches above the iliac crest. And the central ray should be perpendicular to an area which would be right to the middle of the pelvis, which would be two inches inferior to the ASIS and two inches superior to the symphysis pubis. So if you got both of those things going on, two inches superior to the symphysis pubis equals two inches inferior to the ASIS, what does that tell you about the average distance from the ASIS to the symphysis pubis? It's about four inches, right. So when we get to uh, exams where it calls for specifics two inches above the, the symphysis pubis, what can you do? Center two inches below the ASIS, right? Same thing. So we'll get to sacrum and coccyx that uh, might be helpful. All right, so Evidence of proper collimation entire uh, pelvis along with proximal uh, femur. Want both uh, greater trochanters to be uh, without foreshortening and with the ilia equidistant from the edge of the radiograph. So in the center of the image receptor, lower vertebral column centered in the middle, uh, no rotation of the pelvis. Rotation of the pelvis becomes immediately obvious if we have no rotation at all, then our anterior pelvic bones and our obturator foramen look the same. And the peak, the apex of, where is it? Apex of our coccyx is, coccyx is gonna be right there at the symphysis pubis. Now if I have any degree of rotation, watch what happens. The appearance of the anterior pelvic bones is totally different. Our sacrum and coccyx is gonna be off-centered inside of the, the birth canal. What we'll get is it, what appears to be elongation of the um, iliac wing closest to the image receptor and foreshortening of the one furthest from the image receptor. See all that? So a lot of things to look for in rotation. Should look like that. So looking at the anterior pelvic bones, what would you say about this pelvis? Female. Female. Very good. 
All right. So the cleaves method, uh, we've got modified cleaves, we've got original cleaves, and what most people are going to refer to this as is frog leg. Um, so we've got unilateral cleaves, we've got bilateral cleaves, and most people just refer it to a, a frog leg, either a bilateral frog leg or, or just a you know, frog leg, the left hip or the right hip. And what we're going to do with this is we're going to start off with the patient as if we shot a pelvis, an AP of the pelvis. But um, in the, the true modified cleaves for bilateral hips, what we're going to do is we're going to bring both feet up. So you're going to bend both knees as far as the patient can, put the soles of their feet together and externally rotate both of the femurs. So um, draw the feet up to about 45 degrees, put the soles of the feet together, externally rotate. There's a picture of the, the lady in the textbook and you kind of see how that gets the name frog leg. So otherwise we're going to position as if we are positioning for a pelvis. Some of your doctors, some of your um, orthopedic surgeons will actually want you to center a little bit lower so that possibly you get a little bit more of the femur there. But uh, most of your radiologists, if they're you know, just looking for um, you know, the femoral necks, will just want you to, to center as if you were centering for a, a pelvis. Right, so what it's gonna look like is that right there. <clears throat> now notice uh, this patient looks like they've got a, a percutaneous pinning, probably had a neck fracture. But if this image ended right here, then what we would need is further confirmation that there's not a fracture below this prosthesis or this uh, piece of hardware. Generally, if somebody has a, a piece of hardware in and then they have a fracture, the fracture is going to be just below that piece of hardware. So a patient's got plates and screws on their hip because they broke their hip, they fall again. The most stable portion of their their anatomy at that point is their hip itself. So you got this hard plate and just below it, you've just got this soft bone. And what's gonna happen is that if the patient falls down, they're gonna break right below it. So anytime a patient has any kind of hardware in, be it plates and screws or rod or whatever, we're gonna to have to see both ends of that, um, at least on one view. So again, some of your hospitals allow you to shoot an AP of the hip and a lateral of the knee if they have a rod in. Some of your hospitals are gonna to wanna to see AP and lateral both all the way down but you're going to have to see the end of the prosthesis to make sure that there's not a fracture there. And I would say even on this one, even though you, you do see the end of it, um, the patient still could have a fracture just below that. Not this patient. They did a frog leg pretty easily, uh, so it would be an indication they don't have a fracture. But <clears throat> if the patient claimed that they couldn't move or they had significant pain, I'd want to see more of the femur there. Have you done a lot of frog legs? Uh, unilateral. Uh, not a whole lot of bilateral frog legs, but uh, the unilateral, yeah. If, and it's much easier to shoot these than what we'll describe here in a minute, which is a surgical lateral. The Denelius Miller, if the patient has a fracture, that's what you're gonna have to shoot. It's an ugly x-ray, it you know, really is, but if, if the patient can't, do that, then that's what you've got to do. Okay. Okay, so I want to back up just a little bit. Alright, so um so this this is the, the same positioning I was talking about before. Uh, what I'd recommend that you do if you're gonna shoot a, a unilateral frog leg is that um, shoot the AP first because once you get into a unilateral frog leg, what you're going to do is if you're only interested in one hip is you may bend that one leg up and externally rotate. You may rotate the patient just a little bit, but if, if your centering was here and you externally rotate, that's going to put your centering a little bit lateral to where your hip is. All right. So what I'd recommend that you do is shoot your AP first before you try to shoot the frog leg and just keep your positioning of your central ray really in the same place and then take the 
the collimator housing and turn it just a little bit so that you maintain that same positioning where the ASIS was. Does that make sense? So individual hip. We've kind of done this to death. Uh, positioning for a hip, uh, positioning for a femur, fundamentally is just collimation, really, central ray location collimation. For the femur, you know, the mid shaft of the femur, as much of the femur as you can get by, after you get the damage receptor at the top of the, the hip. For the femur, for the, for the hip itself, you're down to a 10 by 12 instead of a um, you know, 14 by 17 per second. So medial, medially rotate the lower extremity 15, 20 degrees, place the femoral neck parallel to the image receptor. Uh, everything about that we've already done. So what it should look like is that right there. So ASIS would be right about there. And again, if, if the patient had a previous hip nail, and they've got some hardware in there, you would need a, a larger image receptor to make sure you see it well. Okay. So unilateral frog leg, you know, we just kind of talked about that as well. So we're not going to do that again. The Hickey method we're not going to cover. That's just ugly. But the Denelius Miller, we are going to. So, um, Denelius Miller, also called the uh, surgical lateral, is cross table, and it's what we use whenever the patient has a fracture uh, because the patient can't assume a, a frog leg. So, again, evaluate your patient. If the foot is externally rotated all the way to the side, then you're not going to do a frog leg. You're not even going to do a true AP. You're going to shoot the, the hip as it is, and then you're going to do this for the lateral. So what you're going to do is you're going to uh, flex the, the knee of the unaffected limb to place the, the thighs vertical as possible. So you're going to raise the, let's say we're shooting for the left leg, you're going to raise the right leg up to uh, up until the, the thigh is vertical or perpendicular to the uh, to the table. You're going to have to put it on something. Don't use the x-ray tube. You put it on the x-ray tube and you're going to move the x-ray tube around. Okay, so you're going to misplace the x-ray tube. You're going to miss the image. So find something to set it on. Um, sometimes a, another tech is going to be in the room and they're, they're just going to want to hold it up. Uh, you shouldn't do that, but, you know, uh, some people will. So you don't want any kind of rotation of the pelvis, so make sure that the, the rotation of the pelvis is, or the, the uh, ASIS or equidistant from the, the tabletop. It says, unless contraindicated, rotate the affected limb uh, 15 to 20 degrees. That would be only if two things. One, the patient probably has a, does not have a fracture, rather. And two, that on the AP, you internally rotated the hip as well. If you didn't internally rotate the hip for the AP, then there's no need to internally rotate it for the surgical lateral. <clears throat> All right? So most of the time, that's, that's going to be contraindicated because your patient's going to have a broken hip. That's the reason you're doing this. Some hospitals will, will shoot the surgical lateral rather than the frog leg on a routine basis. So in some cases, it applies, but most of the time it's not going to apply. All right, so the image receptor has got to be vertical, and this gets kind of confusing, seemingly. So image receptor. What you're going to do is you're going to take the image receptor, the patient's laying flat on their back, like so, and the image receptor is going to be vertical, like this, not vertical like that, but vertical like this, and it should parallel the neck of the femur. So you gotta use a little bit of imagination, uh, try to figure out uh, what the neck of the femur should look like, and you're gonna put the top of the image receptor above the crest. So it's really kinda gotta go into the patient's side a little 
Um, some tags will feel for the, the bottom of the ribs and go just below that. That's fine. Uh, either one works, but it's got to go above the crest definitely. It's got to be vertical and you want it to be as parallel to the natural leg of the neck of the femur. So about like that, about a 45 degree angle. Okay, and the central ray is gonna be horizontal. <clears throat> I need a tall table. So, again, image receptor, mashed in right above the patient's iliac crest, so iliac crest is here. Your central ray is gonna be coming up in between the patient's legs from the opposite side and perpendicular to both the femoral neck and the, the image receptor, okay? So, uh, there we go. So, central ray should be perpendicular to both of those. Okay? So, it's hard to envision. Right? But what you're going to see is that. Right? Now, it's. Some of your textbooks, Merrill's is not included, and I'm, I'm not real sure why, but uh, some of your textbooks will say that uh, instead of just elevating the hip in this step right here, elevating the, the uh, unaffected leg to vertical, they'll say elevated but externally rotated. What that does is it takes the soft tissue on the opposite side and it rotates it out of the way. That cheek gets out of the way a little bit. Right? So you have less soft tissue just over this area right here. So that's what you see right there. And if, if the patient's got a femoral neck fracture or antrochian tear fracture, you might just see it. <clears throat> so Jude views. Jude views are technically views just for the acetabulum itself. And they're typically, and this is traditional, I'm, I'm going to tell you what Talodox like here in a minute. But what it is, is basically two views to show an AP and a lateral view of one acetabulum, okay? So what we're gonna do on Jude's bilateral obliques, so that in one oblique, and it's gonna show us the, the AP of the elevated side, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do two views of both acetabulum. So if, um, Rotated towards my left side, I'm going to see an open acetabulum on my right side. We're going to see the, the AP on the elevated side. The lateral is going to be on the side closest to the image receptor. Okay? So rotate in both directions. Okay? 10 by 12 image receptor just to see the acetabulum. Tyler doctors <clears throat> don't like to see that. What they want to see is a full pelvis, so 14 by 17 image receptor. And they'll use the Jude's, and what they'll see with one oblique is they'll see open acetabulum, right? They'll see open obturator foramen so that these anterior pelvic bones become as perpendicular to the central ray and as parallel to the image receptor as possible. So if you've got fractures in the uh, anterior pelvic bones, you can see those. You get an AP view of the downside um, ilium, you get a lateral view of the upside ilium. So if you've got fractures in e any of those, you can see, you can see uh, basically a lateral view of the downside anterior pelvic bones. So in two views, what we're going to see in one view is we're going to see a lateral of the acetabulum, lateral of the anterior pelvic bones, AP of the acetabulum, AP of the anterior pelvic bones, AP of the ilium, lateral of the ilium, one view. Reverse that to a 45 degree oblique on the opposite side and we see the reverse of all that. Two views, 45 degree oblique, show you everything in the pelvis, any possible fractures in the pelvis. <clears throat> or how our radiologists like to see the, the Judeans. Both 45 degree obliques positioned just like a uh, pelvis, only with 45 
all that stuff. So unilateral Jaday just for the acetabulum, one's going to look like that, one's going to look like that. But that's what they're going to look like um, whenever they're, they're shot as a full pelvis. Common hip fractures, you got the intertrochanteric fracture and femoral neck fractures, like what we talked about before. You got uh, anterior pelvic bone fractures um, that can extend into the acetabulum. You got pelvic wing fractures that can just be nasty. Uh, pelvic wing fractures, whenever we have a fracture in the pelvic wing, uh, in a lot of cases we'll get a lot of sharp little edges on it, and you've got major arteries. You got internal and external iliac arteries running through there. And um, they very well may puncture some of those, so uh, very nasty fractures. Also, the, the bladder, uh, ruptured bladder is not uncommon whenever we have uh, pelvic fractures. We have a hip fracture there, uh, just different types of pelvic fractures. So, any questions? Yeah.